Hello everyone, and welcome back to Stage Fright. In the second half of Richmond Shakespeare Society's Evening of Horrors, we will present a live, fully cast performance of Hamlet from the theatre. And before then, a reading of Dracula, presented by one Jonathan Harker. I awoke in my own bed, and upon opening my pocket watch, discovered that it was already late in the evening. Assuming I had not dreamt my ordeal with those terrible creatures in the night, the Count must have carried me back to my room and locked the door. The small cupboard felt now like a sort of sanctuary, for nothing could have been more dreadful than those women who lurked in the corridors waiting to suck my blood. Mere moments after I awoke, Dracula entered the room. He appeared younger, rejuvenated, and his accent less pronounced. Mr. Harker, I hope you had a good night's rest. Yes, Count, I... Actually, no. No, I'm afraid I, I didn't. I had a, I had a rather queer dream. A dream? More of a nightmare, I suppose. What did you dream of, Mr. Harker? Oh, there were these, these three women, clad in white. They had a strange aura to them, as if they were not natural. This castle is old, Mr. Harker. It is full of the memories and ghosts of the dead. It is best not to dwell on these things. I don't believe in ghosts, Count. I can't believe how late it is already. I must have slept through the day. I myself do the same often. Have you found my books yet? I am sure there is much that will interest you. These companions have been good friends to me ever since I conceived of going to London, and through them I have come to know your great England. To know her is to love her, or so I am told. I long to wander through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to share in the whirl and rush of humanity, its life, its change, its death. All that makes it what it is. But alas, I only know your tongue through these books. But Count, your English is excellent. I thank you, my friend, for your all too flattering estimate. But yet I fear that I am but a little way on the road I would travel. True, I know the grammar and the words, but yet I know not how to speak them. Indeed, I think you speak very well. I think not so. I know that if I did move and speak in your London, all Englishmen would know me as a stranger. That is not enough for me. Here in Transylvania, I am noble. I am a master, and the common people know me. But as a stranger in a strange land, I would be no one. And I have been master here so long that I would be master still, with none other master of me. I know you come to me as an agent of Peter Hawkins, my friend, but I trust that you shall rest here with me in the castle a while, so that by our talking I may learn the English intonation. You must tell me when I make any error, even the smallest, in my speaking. Of course. You may go anywhere you wish in the castle, including my library, except where the doors are locked. There, of course, you may not go. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways, and to you there shall be many strange things. 
Although, from what you have told me of your dreams already, I think you understand something of these strange things. It is said that evil spirits stalk the Carpathians. Surely, evil spirits are not real. <laughs> like I say, Transylvania is not England. The Transylvanian fears the creatures of the night. He knows of ghosts, for there is hardly a foot of soil in all this region that has not been enriched by the blood of men, be them patriots or invaders. It is said that on some mornings the sky turns red with the blood of the night's victims. I see. Ah, but you do not see, Mr. Harker. The blood is the life. It courses through your veins. It fuels your body. It is a precious resource, unlike anything else in nature. Without it, you die. It is both life and death. Here. Do you feel it, Mr. Harker? Your heart beating so fast for such an organ, pumping blood around your body, pumping life. Can you feel the power surging through your veins? It is everything. The blood is the life. But come, tell me of London and of the house which you have procured for me. Of course. Um, let me just uh, fetch these papers. Um, uh, yes. Uh, the uh, state we have procured for you is called Carfax and is a very large, almost uh, medieval. Uh, there are but a very few buildings around it, uh, one being a private lunatic asylum, although you needn't worry about that. I am sure I shall sleep soundly there. I am glad that this Carfax is so old and big. I myself am of an old family, and I know that a house cannot be made habitable in a day. We Transylvanian nobles, have a great appreciation of history, and I shall be most comfortable in this new home. You look weary, Mr. Harker. <laughs> I'm sure I shall be fine. You should go to bed. Uh, of course. G good night, Count. Sleep well, Mr. Harker. It is best not to dwell on nightmares. But I had not forgotten what I'd seen, the brides clad in white. I started to wonder if it was a nightmare at all, or a strange apparition in Dracula's castle. I'd always been a rational man, but what I'd seen was unlike anything I'd ever heard of. I saw no more from the terrible spectres which haunted me on my first night there but I did wander the castle day and night down its dark, cavernous corridors. What did I find? Doors. Doors everywhere, all locked and bolted. In no place save the windows was there an available exit in Castle Dracula. It was a veritable prison, and I was its prisoner. I thought of my dear Mina, far away in England, awaiting my return. Oh, how I wished to run from that dreadful place, to find Mina and embrace her once more. How I longed to hear her sweet voice, to see her beautiful features once more. I soon realized that I had little chance of returning home. This man belongs to me, that's what he said. Dracula had plans for me, and my usefulness was not concluded yet. I was absolutely in his power. 
time grew meaningless at Castle Dracula. Perhaps it was some days later, or perhaps some weeks, after our conversation regarding Carfax Abbey, I saw yet another strange apparition from out of my bedroom window. Dracula, crawling down the castle wall, his cloak spread out around him like the wings of a great bat. I could not believe my eyes, but there he was. It was no trick, no illusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones, and the whole creature moved downwards with considerable speed, like a spider or a lizard. What manner of man is this, I thought? Or what manner of creature in semblance of a man? A few hours later, I awoke, not realizing I'd been sleeping, to a sound from the courtyard. The agonizing cry of a woman, I rushed to the window and throwing it up, peered out of the bars. There indeed was a woman with disheveled hair, leaning against the corner of the gateway. Nosferatu, she called up at the castle. Nosferatu, I know you're there. When she saw my face in the window, she threw herself forward and shouted in a voice laden with menace, Monster! Give me my child! She threw herself forward, and though I could not see her, I could hear the beating of her hands against the door. Somewhere, high overhead, I heard the voice of the Count calling out into the wilderness. His calls seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of the wolves, and mere moments later, a pack of them poured into the courtyard before disappearing from my sight. The sounds, dear God, the sounds, the cry from that poor woman, the howling of the wolves, the laughter of the Count from high above. I covered my ears and prayed into the cold night, longing for morning to arrive. My mind was disturbed with memories of the night before when Dracula entered my room the following evening, holding several pieces of paper and a pen. Good evening, Mr. Harker. I trust that you slept well last night. I'm afraid not, Count. I had queer dreams, and I heard a disturbance in the castle. A disturbance? That is most unfortunate to Mr. Harker. This building is old and so full of ghosts. You must not let the dead keep you awake. Of course. I, I had been meaning to speak to you, Count. My work seems complete here and I'm sure that you shall have no trouble travelling to England by yourself, so... I, I feel I must take my leave and return home. Of course. I, I beg your pardon? You must so wish to hear from your friends. It is a pity that none of them has written to you before now. You have been here some time. Oh, feels like an eternity. You do exaggerate, Mr. Harker. But I appreciate your anxiety. You must write to your friends. Here, I have paper and a pen to hand. You must write three letters to send to our dear England. Three? Yes, three letters for three dates. We must keep your friends updated, must we not? The first must say that your work is nearly done and that you will be journeying home within a few days. This must be dated 12th of June. 12th of June? How long have I been here? We are planning ahead, Mr. Harker. Do not forget that. The second must say that you are leaving the next morning, at the time of writing, of course. Let us say June the 19th. That will provide ample time. Ample time for what, Count? 
You seem worried, Mr. Harker. Do not be so. This will reassure your friends most greatly. Now, then we come to the third. The third will say that you have left the castle and arrived at Vistritz safely for your return journey home. This must be dated June the 29th. Why can't I leave now? My work is complete. Oh, Mr. Harker, it would be impolite to leave so abruptly. You are my guest here, after all. Uh, but I really think no. that... No. Do not ask again, Mr. Harker. Remember, June the 12th, June the 19th, and June the 29th. Write quickly and I will make sure that they are sent to your friends in England. I am sure that Mr. Hawkins will wish to hear from you, as well as your lady friend, I would assume. How did you... What is her name? Mina. Miss Mina Murray. Oh, how she must miss you so, and you her. Do not disappoint her, Mr. Harker. Write to her, if you please, and I will return to collect these letters in a few short hours. What if I don't? That would be most unfortunate for the both of us. You look tired, Mr. Harker. You shall rest soon. I'll go home, you mean? Yes, of course. Remember those dates, Mr. Harker? Write them down now so you don't forget. I now knew the span of my life. God help me. I could do nothing but write these letters for Dracula. It felt as though he were watching every move I made, every breath every thought. His presence was overwhelming. Over the next few days, I began to see strange men outside the castle, taking boxes away in carts. Dracula was planning his move to England. I must have already sent word of this to my employer, Mr. Hawkins. I must have left my suitcase in the dining hall, but Dracula had taken it. My spare clothes, my papers, all taken by that monstrous creature. I knew that I had to escape, and so I planned that on the next night I would do so. The hours passed, leaving me in absolute anguish. How could I escape this hellhole I'd found myself trapped in? But I had to try. I couldn't let this man hold me prisoner any longer. It had occurred to me having seen the Count scale the castle wall in such an inhuman way as he had, that perhaps something similar might be possible for myself. The window itself was tight and difficult to fit through, and I dared not look down upon exiting, but managed to find footholds in the uneven stone surface of the wall. Gradually, I scaled down the castle one step at a time, until I found that I could good go no further. There was no clear way to the ground level, and I was struggling to keep my hold on the stones. To my side, there was another window leading to another room. And before I could even think, I threw myself inside. Then the fear hit me. What if the Count was here? I looked up, examined the room closely. He or rather it, was nowhere to be seen. Instead, I found rows of boxes lined up and ready to be taken away. Clearly, some had gone already, I discovered, looking at the pattern of dust on the floor. Into two of these boxes I went, but saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dust. However, in the third, I made a discovery. There, in one of the great boxes, 
on a pile of newly dug earth lay the Count. He was either dead or asleep, I couldn't say which, for the eyes were open and stony, but without the glassiness of death. And the cheeks had the warmth of life through all their pallor. The lips were red as ever, but there was no sign of movement, no pulse, no breath, no beating of the heart. I bent over him and tried to find any sign of life, but in vain. I thought he might have keys on him to open the door, but when I went to search, I saw the dead eyes, and in them, dead though they were, such a look of hate, though unconscious of me or my presence. I couldn't stare at that monster any longer. I made my way over towards the door at the end of the room before I heard the voice. Mr. Harker, I thought you were asleep. It is of no matter. We can talk together, man to man. Is that what you are, Count? I have seen you with those women. Those creatures. What are you? It did not need to go this way, Mr. Harker. Your predecessor, Mr. Renfield, he understood. He did as I asked him, and no harm came to him. He lost his mind. He was locked away in a hospital. No physical harm. You do not understand what you have glimpsed here in this castle. I can see your mind trying to comprehend, to understand. I may not understand what you are, Dracula, but I know that you're a monster. I saw what happened to that poor woman the other night. You see, and yet you still don't understand. Those are my clothes. You're, you're wearing my clothes. If I am to live with the Englishman, I would wish to look like an Englishman, to sound like an Englishman, so that the Englishman will not discern me from one of their own. Why? Here in Transylvania, the people know me. They know who I am, what I am. Nosferatu. Indeed. If I am to continue living, I must find a new place to call home. And your England is so far and so beautiful. I shall be very happy there. And I have you to thank, Mr. Harker. You and your Mr. Hawkins. I shall give him your regards upon my meeting him. You... You leave him alone. You are going to be missed at home, are you not? What about your fiance, Miss Nina? I would like to visit her while I am in England, to give her my condolences and to help her through these difficult times. It is unfair to be widowed before marriage, but alas, these things are out of my control. Do not worry, Mr. Harker. Your letters shall be posted accordingly. I will make sure of that. Are you going to kill me? Kill you? No. I will not kill you. But if I am to leave my beautiful brides here in Transylvania, they will need something to eat. <laughs> Is he ours at last? You may do with him as you please. It is best not to resist them, Mr. Harker. I must go now and post your next letter. You have been a good ally to me, and it is a shame that you cannot accompany me to your precious England. I have great plans for her and all in her bloodline. After all, the blood is for life. The blood, the blood is, is the, life. the life. Goodbye, Mr. Harker. 
We shall not meet again. Please! No! 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 And that is where our story ends for tonight. Dracula was making his way for England. I had no means of stopping him. The rest is quite remarkable. But alas, I don't have time this evening to continue. Perhaps one day you shall hear the rest. But until then, I thank you very much for listening. And I wish you all a very good evening. Hey, Scott. Yeah, I do. You haven't seen Matt or Francis around by any chance, have you? No, I've only just got it. Oh, we're meant to be starting Act Two any minute, but I can't find him anywhere. Well, oh, that's Matt's bag there, so he's got to be around. Oh, they definitely arrived then. Oh, I might try giving him a call. You are, right, Gaff? Yeah, not too bad. Oh, you haven't seen Francis or Matt around, have you? No, not today. Mm-hmm. You here for Hamlet? Yeah, I'm prompting. I'll just be in the corner. So, where did you want me for this bit? I think we'll just start off with you on the stage. Maybe here? Okay. And then we'll move yeah. over to the Hamlet guys. Okay, and then, um, just can I ask this bit? Oh, okay, so that bit is in the bar. Okay, hi, Scott. Here are, guys. Hi. When you're ready. Can anyone smell that? What? Something garlicky, who is it? Can you put it away, please? It's very distracting. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest of most excellent fancy. He had borne me on his back a thousand times, and now, how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed, I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now? 
Your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that will want to set the table on a roar. Not one now to mock your own grinning. Quite chapfallen. Now, get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick to this favour she must come. Make her laugh at that. Prithee, Horatio, tell me one thing. Oh, uh, what thing? What's that, my lord? What's that, my lord, lady? What's that, my lord, lady? Dost thou think Alexander looked to this fashion in the earth? Probably not. Oh, for God's sake! I can't believe we open on Saturday night. Oh, it could have been worse. <laughs> According to the messenger, Rosencrantz and Guildenstein died in Act One. Mm, it's always a bit of improvising. They're not even introduced until Act Two. Yeah, that might have been a bit of a stretch. It was a complete disaster. Oh. It's not a complete disaster. Francesca was really good. She was, wasn't she? Brilliant. Best bit of casting in the whole play. Mm. Do you know, I might see if she wants a drink. After all of that. Uh, yeah, good. Good. I'm just a bit tired. You were brilliant. <laughs> you were bloody brilliant. Thank you. Um, I was getting a bit worried. The tech seemed to be going on longer than usual. <laughs> no thanks to certain actors who can't remember any of their lines. <laughs> okay, do you want one? No, thanks. I don't drink wine. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, I was so up for this show. The definitive Hamlet. The best Shakespeare the RSS has ever done. <laughs> Frankly, it's been a complete nightmare. <laughs> Most of the actors don't know any of their lines. You accepted, of course. The lighting, a complete mess. And Rosencrantz and Guildenstein died in Act One. Uh, yes, yes, that was a bit <laughs> odd. <laughs> they had to go on as ghosts in Act <laughs> Two. I mean, what's going on with that? I'm sure it'll be all right on the night. <laughs> I wouldn't stake my life on it. <laughs> oh, you know, to be honest, I was a bit worried about you before today. Why? Well. You missed all the afternoon rehearsals. I mean, it was like you were allergic to sunlight or something. In fact, somebody was even joking that you were a vampire. <laughs> yes, um, I'm sorry. I just, I just been so busy. Oh no, 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 no! I, I don't mean to moan. Oh gosh, is that the time? No wonder I'm shattered. Well, I've got work tomorrow. That's weird. <laughs> Maybe I've drunk too much. I haven't drunk enough. Oh no. It's a shame to lose you, but I've been so hungry recently. The show must go on. Thankfully your part is over now. Try not to struggle. It makes it harder to clean up.
ne leija. Useless. Where is everyone? Um, is there no one else in here? No, it's like everyone's disappeared. <laughs> I don't know what to do. It's supposed to be going live with Hamlet in a minute or two. I guess we'll have to do something else then. That's a bit weird, though. Do you want me to do a story? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Like a, a ghost story or something could be good. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Over here? Yeah, yeah, over there. Um, right, uh, let's go and get everything set up. We should be live in a few minutes. Okay, I'll try and find one and now we come to the final part of our evening. I am afraid there have been a few uh, difficulties with our live performance of Hamlet this evening, uh, but we've prepared an alternative. I will read you the terrifying ghost story by R.P. Holmes, Whistle in the Night. It was pitch black outside. But nevertheless, I sat in my rather uncomfortable armchair in my office there was a storm brewing in the sky, and the occasional burst of thunder reverberated across the city. I had brought with me a book to keep me entertained, a collection of ghost stories by M. R. James, but I was under no illusion that this would be a long night. Even with a foreboding storm in the distance, it felt oddly quiet and calming. There was no one around, and I remained safe and locked within my office, it was then that I heard it. A whistling from somewhere nearby. It almost sounded like it was calling me. I thought... I thought nothing of the sound and returned to my book. Minutes passed, but I still couldn't get comfortable. The bitter wind outside had chilled my bones and not even a fire could have warmed them. In the strangest sensation, I almost felt like I was getting colder, sat there in my office. And then I heard it again, the whistling. I'm sorry, everyone, I keep getting distracted by something. Can you hear that? I'm just going to check what's it. Are you coming with me? Come on, then. Oh, no! Oh. Oh. 